what if our need for social connection is actually more fundamental than our need for food and water? If we are not attached as infants, we will die. So the it just hardwired into us, that need for attachment actually gets us our food and our water. Welcome, everybody. Today, I'm excited to have Michael Bauman with us to talk about how to navigate the loneliness of entrepreneurship and success. He's been around the world. He's got a lot of great insights, and I'm happy to have him here to share them with us. Thanks so much for joining us today, Michael. Absolutely. Pleasure to, pleasure to be here. Sweet. So Michael is the CEO of Success Engineering and a Tony Robbins certified coach. He helps entrepreneurs feel they are enough and not alone, along with optimizing every area of their lives, including their habits, productivity, and health. He's also the host of the Success Engineering podcast. Mike, would you just start out, share a little bit about your journey and kind of what got you into this work? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So I originally, I was born in, in Papua New Guinea and I grew up my whole life over there. So for people that don't know, it's a, a, a tropical island right above Australia. And I loved growing up there. There was tons of wonderful experiences, but part of what started that journey, obviously, is my childhood and things like that. And it's interesting to see when you've traveled around the world, when you've been in different cultures, like I, you know, the people in Papua New Guinea, very poor, they didn't have very much money. A lot of them, a lot of times they had food, but not a lot of money. And but you'd see how happy they are like these, they're just so happy. They don't have all the stuff that we typically enjoy here in the West. So happy, so hospitable. I mean, obviously, there's still people, there's still frustrations, there's still these different things, you know, and, and then it's interesting when I came back to the States, you'd see the reverse. I'd see these people with these huge houses and cars and all of this just stressed all the time. Um, not really happy people. Uh, and that I feel like that was kind of in the undercurrent of going on behind the scenes, like what, what actually helps people be happy? What helps them feel successful and what that looks like. And then further on the story. So I, I was a personal trainer. I was a nutrition coach and I was um, the assistant department head of my gym facility. And I kind of hit a glass ceiling and I was like, I'm going to jump out there. Entrepreneurship life. You know, we have all the dreams of like, I want to make a ton of money and have all this time to enjoy it or whatever. And two weeks after I left my job, my wife wasn't working at the time. We found out we were pregnant with our first kid. So we, we literally have no money. We're, we're on food stamps, like the hardest dark. My wife is struggling with depression. It's like the hardest, darkest time of my life. I'm like knocking door to door, trying to like sell my services and go like, I need money to pay the bills, you know? And so lonely during that period of time and really felt like a failure. felt like I wasn't, wasn't enough. And there's been other times during that, but kind of insert into that. I, I stumbled across start with why by Simon Sinek. And there's a part in it where he's at this gathering of the Titans, it's called some multimillionaire entrepreneurs at, at MIT. And the speaker asked them, how many of you have achieved your financial goals? 80% of the room put their hands up. You know, most of them don't have to work another day in their life. And then the speaker follows it up with how many of you feel like a success? And 80% of this room put their hands back down. And that story in the midst of that crazy time for me, just stood out. And that was the foundation of success engineering. I'm going, what we're looking at is not actually the appearance of success. It's going, how can I feel like a success in every area of our life? So how can I feel like a successful father? How can I feel like a success as a, a business owner? Um, how can I feel like a success as a, a spouse or with my finances, with my body, whatever that looks like. So that's the brief kind of overview of how I, how I got into that. Awesome. Thanks. I think there, there's so many different things to unpack there. At times, people have talked about the sense of a person's ability to be happy with less. And then some people go to and take that to an extreme and say, well, therefore, you should not have things. And you know, it can either glorify one or like either glorify poverty or, or, or demonize being wealthy. What have you seen as far as that balance? Because, and in my question, there's an assumption that yes, one person, a person can have money and be happy and also not have money and be happy. What was it that helped you balance those? Or what have you seen? Because I know I've seen some of it in different places I visited. Um, my parents are from Trinidad and Tobago. My wife's from Peru. I've lived in a few different cultures. I've been to India and seen people that 
I wouldn't necessarily want to be in their financial situation. <laughs> and yet at the same time, there's something there that you see this light of, of just happiness, that present moment contentness, that as you mentioned, sometimes you don't see where people have their stuff together. Uh, what have you seen maybe are some of the distinctions or maybe just share a little bit of what you've seen on that if you don't mind. Yeah, and it really depends. So this is the interesting thing. It it absolutely depends on the individual. It depends on what you want. And what I talk about is like, unless you clearly define success for yourself, you'll just revert to society. You'll revert to the cultural norms that are around you. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a bad thing if you get to the point that you thought it would be a success. And then you're like, oh, wow, this doesn't feel like a success at all. So I would say it's completely individual. And that's the interesting thing. You can actually take your definition of success and you can filter it through values. So you can ask the questions of going like, what would feel like freedom in the areas of my wealth? For some people, that would be, you know, they, they want to give away like millions of dollars. They want to be philanthropists. They want to give away millions of dollars. Like that feels like freedom. They're financially independent. For other people, that's like, I have enough to eat and I go surfing every day, right? That feels like freedom from, from my wealth. But then you can also ask other questions around like, how could I actually be at peace in terms of my wealth? And you can do this with your body as well. Like, how can I actually be content with my body? What, what would that look like, right? Or what would freedom look like with my body? Some people want to climb Mount Everest and other you know, people are like, I want to get up and down off the ground and be able to play with my grandkids. So that varies. And then you can, you ask like, what brings me joy in the areas of my wealth? So it's not necessarily the money itself. That's the problem. It's, it's going, how can I be intentional about what's behind it? What am I actually wanting to create? What am I actually wanting to feel? And then going, how can I align the hows and the what's and the processes and stuff with that feeling. So exactly. I mean, there's people that don't have a lot and they might, you know, want more and that's totally fine. There's a lot of research around, you know, our happiness increases up to around the 70,000, 70,000 range. And people say it doesn't increase above that. It actually does, but in a different way. So you don't have a daily increase in happiness after that period of time, but there is if you measure it in a different way than impact and contribution that you can actually have an increase beyond that. But the, the thing that I like asking when we look at success, if you're looking at a success kind of formula on one hand, it can be achieve more, right. And then I, then I equal a success for whatever that is. The other hand is actually want less. So what like, and you just play with it, right. You experiment with it. What if I actually went, what if I wanted less, what would that look like? Right. And you get to determine for yourself what that looks like, but that's kind of my answer to that question. It really depends on the individual and what they want. Yeah, I think there's so many variables to it. And definitely trying to take someone else's definition doesn't always work. I mean, we can look to other people for, for guidance. I think of what I used to define as success as health and, and how I look at it now. As a youngster, I wanted to you know build big muscles, all that sort of stuff, I have a six pack. Now, if I can play volleyball every Friday healthily for three to five hours, that's my main focus. And as somebody who does not have a lot of, or at least I don't, I don't see myself as a disciplined person, but I see myself as an inspired person. If I'm inspired to do something, so I'll do my yoga just about every day to stretch so I can play volleyball on Friday. But if you say, wait, do this because, and I guess it's that whole external reason, because it's good for you, because it's supposed to, eh, not so much so. Um, one of the things that you and I talked about that I thought was um, really important was people understanding what their needs are. And a lot of people entrepreneurially were very focused on what the needs of our business are. And we take courses and content and we read all this stuff. And yet sometimes we seem to forget that we're at the center of all of that. Um, where would you say that comes in in the sense of even for the person who says, look, I really am financially success driven right now. So right now, Michael, I need to make a lot of money. And so I'm willing to take not the shortcuts, but I'm willing to lose some sleep. I'm willing to miss out on relationships and then I'll make up for those. And then I'll get to those later. Curious your thoughts on that and, and what you've seen in the reality of how it plays out, not the storybook of what well, you should or you shouldn't, but what actually happens when people take that approach. 
Yeah, I'm going to say there's two there's two things. There's definitely season. Sometimes people like, you know, we we look at st- success as a static thing and just like you mentioned, like it depends on your life stage. It depends on whether there's a global pandemic. Like it depends on all of these different variables and you can you can look at success on a very micro level like what would success feel like for me today or in this moment all the way up to a very macro level in terms of like the impact that I want to have 100 years after I'm you know gone from this world so you can you can adjust those different time frames and and do that as well but the thing that I would talk about you brought up a very a very crucial point is talking about the needs so when you when you're driving in your business and this is what I help entrepreneurs realize is, is a lot of times it's because there's this emptiness inside of them that goes, I just don't feel like I'm in enough. And I have been there, you know, so many times, right? It's, it's you know, sometimes we bookmark these things. This is a thing that's still a challenge, right? Where you go, am I doing this because I don't feel like enough? And you have to unpack that a lot of times with emotions, especially in a Western culture, we either like push them away, we repress them, we're like, pretend they don't exist. But there there are signposts for fundamental needs that we have that are going unmet. They're like the, the body's warning system, right? And so there's different ways. We have different needs, but there's these fundamental needs of certainty that we have. There's a need for variety that we have in our life. There's a need for love and connection. And there's also a need to like matter, a need for significance, and then for growth and impact and different things like this. So my question would be, when you're pursuing that, that avenue, actually stop and ask yourself, what, what need am I actually trying to meet with this? Am I trying to meet a need for certainty, right? So it's like, if I have a million dollars in my retirement home, then I'll feel safe, right? So I'm trying to meet that, or I'm trying to meet this need for a variety. Like, I feel like I'm just stuck in the routine, my entrepreneurial life, like I'm over here, I'm doing this, I'm traveling, I'm talking to these people, whatever, right? Or it's a, a need to like matter. Like maybe your, your parents were just like, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. You're always a failure, whatever that is. And you go like, I, I need to feel significant. And that's not a bad thing. I need to feel like I belong. I need to feel like I matter. And that aspect of love and connection, maybe it's like connecting with other people, like-minded people, or maybe it's a growth thing. Maybe it's a significant thing, but you have to kind of stop and go, what is this signpost? What is this actually pointing towards? And maybe I can get this need for certainty or connection or love or significance or whatever it is. Maybe I could get it met in a different way that would produce a different outcome that would potentially bring my life more into balance. Thanks. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. I know um, this idea in entrepreneurship of, of feeling like we have needs, needs, needy victim like there's all these associations that have come with as opposed to well no no i i need oxygen i need water there, there are certain things i need if you know if you take them away they're really going to hurt uh there are other needs perhaps like generic needs yes i need attention recognition feedback i might not need that from a specific person uh, but i need those in general and i i forget where i heard this but i remember somebody explaining the idea of if you can match up the need like you're saying with what will actually meet its need, you're in a good place. So if you're thirsty and you drink water, that's going to help. And that's a physical need and you give it a physical substance. Whereas if you have an emotional need, if you'll accept it and you drink a beer, that's not going to meet that need. It might put you <laughs> in a mindset to feel happy or forget about it, but ultimately it's a mismatch, I guess, on some level. And what I'm hearing you say is that there, you know, there needs to be a little bit of intentionality or at least even looking back and saying, okay, yeah, when I do this, I feel good about this. And you know, one of the things I remember when I went on a trip uh, to India, I just remember being in a train and seeing some of the kids that were playing and they were very happy. And then I went to Machu Picchu in Peru and the same thing. And I remember seeing some of these kids just joy, happy, just complete joy on their faces over what their current circumstance was. Now, granted, somebody could say, well, wait, they're kids, they're playing soccer or, you know, uh, or football if you're in the rest of the world <laughs> and you know and and so there really wasn't as much stress and this and that is okay but it feels like a lot of the times we adults can't even give ourselves those moments those moments of look okay i know i have work monday let's say or if i know i have this big project or i know i have this thing that needs to be done that i'm going to need to bear down and focus 
But can I on my weekends? Can I in the evenings? Can I when I'm at dinner be present as opposed to looking at my phone? Not because I don't love the person. I think so many people assume it's that, but because I'm just so consumed. I'm so fearful. I'm so worried. I'm so uncertain. Um, and, and as you mentioned, these other things are driving me. I'm not driving. I'm being driven by something. Somebody's, you know, I don't have the steering wheel in my hand. Something's pushing me. Um, what have you found for entrepreneurs as far as how they can kind of look at or even get a sense of what is it that maybe is something that's working for them and it's not versus something that's not? In other words, how, how can that self-diagnosis work? Because very often when we are working as entrepreneurs in our silos, I've worked from home for over 20 years. It's only sometimes, at least in my experience, when you go out and meet with other people like, wow, I've been in the cave for a while and I didn't <laughs> see this and I didn't see that. Oh, wait, I got to brush my hair and oh, I got this thing. Yeah, I mean, whatever it is, how can a person without going too extreme into thinking that every moment has to be a moment of bliss, but how can a person look and say, oh, you know what? Maybe I'm off target on this because I'm not going in a certain direction. Like, what are those signs? What does that look like where someone might say, yeah, you know what? I, I might need not necessarily psychological help, and there's nothing wrong with that either, but where a person might say, yeah, you know what? I might need to take a look at my needs, my emotional needs, my, my needs to connect with people. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot that a lot of that goes in a lot that goes into that for sure. One of the things, and this is incredibly powerful for me, it, it reframed pretty much everything for me. I, I heard about it. There's a phenomenal book. I'd recommend every entrepreneur or any person pretty much read it. It's called The Gap and the Gain. And it's by um, Dan Sullivan. Um, you're nodding your head. You're, you're familiar with it. Just phenomenal. But what it essentially talks about is so often we're measuring the gap from where we are to where we want to be. And he, he says just an incredibly powerful quote in there. He says, you can only measure the distance that you've traveled from where you started to where you are now. And that's measuring the gain. And this is, it's crazy from a macro level to a very micro level. So let's say you go to, you know, your favorite sandwich place and you get your sandwich and they forgot to put, you know, the mustard on it or the garlic aioli, whatever it is on there that you really like. All of a sudden you're like, shoot, like the, you know, sandwich isn't as good as it is, like as it was before. You're, you're measuring the gap. You're not measuring the gain of like, I'm at my favorite sandwich place having my favorite sandwich, right? So from a very micro thing, all the way up to extremely macro things, what if we actually measured the gains of the things that we do? And this is what I started on a huge emphasis, even for this year, I'm going, you know, at the end of every day, we have our, you know, review or daily reviews and we look at, okay, what did I accomplish? looking at the next day, what do I need to accomplish our weekly reviews or monthly reviews year, whatever in, in like incorporating into that, I actually have done like a done list and a celebration list. And I go, what did I accomplish today? Right. And then I actually like celebrate it. I get, I put myself in a state of celebration, not, not externally, just in terms of like giving yourself a pat on the back or picturing like people surrounding you and going like, great job, Michael, you're doing a great job. And I have that on a daily, on a weekly and on a monthly basis, because that changes the state of my days, right? We live, we live in our days. We think like the vacation that we're going to take in, you know, three months is going to make up for the daily state and the feeling that I have today. And it doesn't. So I go, how can I celebrate myself today? We're totally fine. Like we have no problem beating ourselves up because we're like, that gets us to the next level and you should be doing this. And here's this weakness and optimize, 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 right? But we're, we're not as good at actually celebrating ourselves. But the celebration activates your dopamine. And when you activate your dopamine, it can actually rewire, rewire the neural pathways of your brain to different habits. It's a phenomenal way to actually kind of hack your habits. And so doing that, you actually live more on the positive side by making it an intentional focus. So my question is going like, how can you actually focus on the gain and what you've accomplished? Because that's the only way to measure the distance you've traveled or the success that you've achieved. Yeah, that's so true. I'm a huge fan of Dan Sullivan's work. Uh, I was blessed to be introduced to him by my father, gosh, in the mid 90s. Um, really good stuff. And for those who aren't familiar with him, he's kind of a, he's a Tony Robbins level guy who simply never sought Tony Robbins level attention. And that's not a right. compliment or a criticism to either two different approaches. He's been more of a quiet behind the scenes coaches, entrepreneurs. And yes, um, it, it's so interesting 
when we focus on what's working and, and it sounds Pollyanna-ish, it sounds optimistic, it sounds, well, wait, you're not living in the real world. And I usually think of athletes, I think is the closest analogy, or maybe because I've, I've played a lot of sports growing up and I would think about, well, you know, when's the best time for you to hit a shot? Well, after you just hit a shot, you know, when you, you start getting on this roll momentum, whether it's it's true or not, there's the belief in momentum, or if it's baseball, streaks, you know, hitting streaks. If it's, um, you know, basketball, they'll talk somebody's in the zone and, and, you know, the bucket just looks so wide and they just throw the ball and it goes in. And the skill set was there. And this is the thing that's really interesting to me. The skill set's been there the whole time. And yet one day, you know, person will be in the zone and then two weeks later, they're not for like a month. And then they'll be in another time, they will be. And how do we cultivate that? I really like your idea of the 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 done list. I'm definitely going to implement that for myself because, my goodness, it's so easy for us. And actually, speak to this if you don't mind, because this is this is the part you you hit on something I think is so. I believe it's a myth. I've not done enough research, but anecdotally, I do this idea of beating ourselves up to motivate ourselves to get ourselves going. And I've always felt that if I have to do that, that maybe something was missing. I didn't really, you know, because I don't have to beat myself up to love my kids. I don't have to beat myself up to want to go play volleyball. The things that are really important to me, I don't have to give myself a pep talk. Um, what do you find or what have you seen with people that try to use that approach of either pushing or that borderline more beyond just pushing, but almost shaming themselves or, or, or trying to, overforce themselves uh, into wanting to do something and how effective is it long term short term and, and what are perhaps the side effects uh, of somebody doing that. That's a really good question and that hits on a really important thing that a lot of entrepreneurs um, and people just in general face um, that that idea that we have to shame ourselves to a certain spot and and the question really is, and it, it can work to accomplish the things that, that you want. But then at the same time, that's kind of what I, I talked about at the beginning, you get to that point, you go, wow, is this the life that I really want to want to live? And the bunch of research, you know, Brene Brown did tons of research on shame and guilt and just showing like, actually, it doesn't, it doesn't produce the positive results. There's tons of research, phenomenal research done by um, Kristen Neff. She wrote a book called Self-Compassion. Also another one I'd recommend pretty much everybody read. It's how to actually change it towards being more compassionate with yourself. And the research, everything from like weight loss to you know performance in business, all of that, it actually shows the people that are more compassionate with themselves have better outcomes um, in pretty much every area of your life. So what you're doing in that situation is rooted in something that's deeper and that's farther back, right? And so the interesting thing is to kind of ask the question, again, it goes back to that emotions or even behaviors. If you have a behavior like an addictive behavior or a behavior that you're constantly doing, actually asking, stopping and asking that behavior, what is the positive intent behind this? We view it as like a negative thing, but it's going like, what are you actually trying to protect me from? And just pondering that going like, what are you trying to protect me from? And a lot of times you can follow that up with a question and just go like, if I was completely and totally protected, what would be even more important than that? And for, you know, you might be like, oh, it would actually be to be okay with myself, to, to, to receive love, you know, from other people, like to actually feel like I can be loved. And then you can continue to ask that. And this is actually through Tony Robbins. Um, it's called the highest intent technique. You can, you can follow that up with, if I was completely and totally loved or I was completely and totally okay with myself, what would be more important than that? And a lot of times then it's actually taking what you have and giving it out to other people. So giving other people love and uh, making an impact. And then, you know, if you, if you totally gave out all the love, what would be more important than that? And then it might be, you know, connection, you know, depending on your views, it might be connection with God. It could be, you know, actually a dissolution of your ego, a dis dissolution of the self. Um, and very quickly, just by asking that question, you can actually get up to a lot higher intent that the signpost of your emotion or your behavior, even the one that you don't like, 
is, is showing you. And then from that highest intent, you can actually bring it back down. So if I was completely, you know, connected with God, or if I had completely, you know, dissolved myself, how would that affect me giving love to other people? Right. And then if I was completely and totally giving love from other people from that perspective, I'm bringing it down. How would that affect me receiving my life? And then you bring it back down to the feeling that you actually have and pay attention. How did that change? Right. So that feeling of not enough, this, that feeling of guilt that you're just trying to like solve with an external problem. How did that change very quickly, you know, by, by doing that? What would it look like if I actually took that highest intent into what I was doing? Would I do things differently? And you might not, right? It's, it's, it's analyzing it for yourself and going like, what, what do I actually want at a very deep level? Yeah, that's, wow. That's so, so cool. Um, when I, when I think about the times or the, the things that have worked in my business, despite lots of strategic planning, some of the things that have worked out the best were not things that I at least intellectually conceived. There were things, opportunities that presented themselves and I fortunately was willing enough to listen or to hear that the client was saying or the prospective client at the time was, oh, I'd rather have this instead. I sometimes also think of what perhaps opportunities have gone past me because I, I couldn't see them. And whenever I do sales coaching with people, one of the things I'll talk about it with them is, you know, very often there's sales walking in front of you, but if you can't see them, you know, it's like the person that's basically saying, I, you know, I need this thing that would make me feel better and this, that, and the other. And it's like exactly such and such. And you're like, but you don't know what that such and such is. So it's, they're just right in front of you and it goes right by you. It seems like this puts you in such a, just a higher place to be more open. There's um, an affirmation I love. There's a book called Creative Visualization uh, by Shakti oh, Gawain. Yeah. And I love, you know, this is one of the first, like, gosh, 30 ish, 40 ish years ago books on visualization. Like, so, so much of what's being done today has some sort of roots in that, or at least inspired by that. And one of the premises is, of course, that you, you know, you look to visualize what you want to see happen. But then there's this part that she would always put at the end, which I think is, gosh, it's just, just the whole phrase is a, is a, a way of approaching life of you know, this or something better is now manifesting in totally harmonious ways for all involved or something like that. But in other words, it's, it's like, look, it can work out for everybody. Um, it's, it's, it's already in process. It's not something that, you know, that I'm, I'm not worthy of or whatnot, but this or something better. And for me, that was the part of like, oh, so that's how I can go from white knuckled goal that has to be exactly the way I think I see it to intention of, oh, okay, I want to be happy. I want to be abundant. And again, the things that, the left brained entrepreneur or or left brained entrepreneur voice would say no no we, we can't measure things by happiness and joy and fulfillment we've got to have metrics darn it we've got to have how many followers how many likes how many you know what's the roi what's the conversion rate and and i mean i want all those things Th those are great but if they come at the expense of the other things i, I don't think i want those how would you say that you've been able to help or what do you find helps people put those most important things first and yet still honor you know the real metrics we, we got to make money we can't just say we're going to help people and, and and be happy that that's great if we're independently wealthy but if we're entrepreneurs <laughs> that you know need to pay bills we have to be able to balance those how do you find or what do you suggest people do where they can, whether the word is lead or stay centered on or whatever it is, what is perhaps most important to them, not your values, not my values. And I think you, you and I already get this, but how can they stay most true to themselves while they're doing, like how can they be in that space while they're doing the doings that then get them, you know, the income that they need to have or whatever it might be so that they can you know, continue their journey? That's a great question. And, you know, like you, you mentioned it for entrepreneurs, a lot of times it's just incredibly busy. The last thing we need is like, I'm going to put something else on your plate. And you're just like, where, like, right. Like, you know, it has to cost something. It has to go somewhere. Right. 
And I love, like, I absolutely love, um, it's, it's called the two minute, two minute rule. It's from, um, James Clear's atomic habits. Um, but basically looking, I love two minutes and I love five minutes. Like I do all of these different things, these habits that I have in my life that are like two minutes or five minutes, right? So it might be five minute meditation. It might be five minute stretch. It might be a five minute workout that, you know, literally got me through COVID. Um, that, that is how I use those things to, you know, put in my life. So it, you know, a lot of times too, even with entrepreneurs, I have what's called the enoughness bookmark. So at the start, and I actually got this from Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. She says, no matter what gets done or is left undone, I am enough. And I'm like, what if we started our day by actually saying that? Like if I'm in the shower and I'm saying like, no matter what gets done today, because we're basically playing an infinite losing game. Like there is an infinite amount of to-do lists that will always be left undone. And you will always feel not enough because you didn't get enough done because you're infinitely losing, right? So what if you actually stepped back from that and said, no matter what gets done, no matter what gets left undone, I am enough. And then at the end of your workday or the end of the day, what if you bookmarked it with that as well? And you just said, hey, I, you know, I, I, we all like, I mean, we don't have a problem with the drive most of the time, right? Like, you know, we, we, we get it done, but then just saying like, I did my best. No, like, and no matter what I got done, I am enough. And then you can actually, you know, this is kind of the behavioral psychology around it. You can use triggers um, they can be environmental triggers. They can be context triggers, whatever it is in your life. You know, they can be, you know, BJ Fogg talks about like anchor habits, right? Like brushing your teeth, something that's so much a habit that you don't have to think about. You can use those triggers to basically reset your intention. So when you walk through a door, you can use that, you know, if you're getting in your car, if you're walking through a door, you can use that and go like, Okay, I'm just going to, um, Brendan Burchard, a phenomenal um, peak performance coach, talks about this. Like, I am going to release tension, and I'm going to set intention for the next thing that I'm doing. So I walk through a door, and I'm going, whatever came before, I'm just going to let it go, and then I'm going to set my intention for going into this space. Maybe it's with your family, you know, maybe you're letting the work go, or maybe it's like, okay, can't think about what's going on with my family right now because I have this important meeting. But these tiny little things that allow you to just come back and go, what is going on with me? Maybe it's a minute, maybe it's two minutes. And what is the intention that I actually want to show up in this next situation? And it doesn't take more time out of your day. I'm a huge fan of things like that. That's awesome. I think, uh, number one, I love how well studied you are and how well versed you are. I've many of the mentors you've mentioned, I've, I've read their stuff and gosh, I just... <laughs> So I got, I got the big pictures. I got to write down some more of the habits. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I found, and it sounds like you do this, is just exposure to, to happy, intelligent, well-rounded, multidimensional people just over and over. I mean, I think I started with Zig Ziglar with his tape series and then Wayne mm -hmm. Dyer and different people like that. Going back to the loneliness, um, obviously, we don't want to focus on the loneliness. We want to but that's one of the things that comes up for people when we're uh, trying to make things happen, things aren't going the way we'd like, or just in general, we're on our journey. And, and this, I think, just to broaden it, it doesn't have to be entrepreneurs, it can be anybody, everybody has this on some level. How does the loneliness affect our physiology, our productivity, our decision making, the quality of life? In other words, how does it show up for the person who says, again, you know, I can tough my way through this. You know, you know, Michael, you sound a little soft, man. You know, this is, I'm a, I'm a big boy, I can, I can tough my way through this. How does it eventually show up in ways that then do start impacting people um, in those different areas of their life? This is, I mean, this is extremely important. And I will, I will take it all the way back to basically the fundamental needs that we have. So you have Abraham, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the bottom, you have your, you know, food, shelter, safety, you know, above that, you kind of have your safety, things like that. And then then you get into your self-esteem, your connection, your self-actualization. But there's actually a ton of research coming out um, pretty recently that talks about they're arguing, what if our need for social connection is actually more fundamental than our need for food and water? And you go, 
that doesn't make sense, but it actually does. Like when you look at attachment theory and they did all the studies on those wireframe monkeys, you know, they had a monkey that was cuddly, but didn't have any food. And then they had a monkey that was just a wireframe that provide the food. And they thought the, you know, the baby monkeys would go to the wireframe because it was just a sustenance. They would get their food there and then they'd go over to the cuddly, cuddly monkey. And it was the foundation of attachment theory. Basically, like if we are not attached as infants, we will die. So the it just hardwired into us, that need for attachment actually gets us our food and our water. And then you see it in like, you know, you watch any National Geographic documentary, right? That lone zebra that's running there and like just gets taken down by the zebra or the, or the cheetah or the lion or whatever it is. That isolation from the herd actually triggers in us uh, like a, a incredible fear because it's going like, I am actually at threat. I am physically at threat right now. I'm physically in a threatening situation. And we don't realize that there's this fundamental need that we have for social connection. And there's a fundamental pain that we have associated with it. And that fundamental pain is, is, is loneliness. And you'll see it in the language that we use, right? So if you have like a heartache, right? It's like I have a headache or a stomach ache, right? I, you know, that person broke my heart because we're trying to express that like, it's like they broke my arm. And what's crazy, people don't actually realize that social pain, like social rejection and physical pain light up the exact same neural network in your brain. It's almost exactly the same. So your brain looks at it as pain, and, and then you look at all of the studies, the studies actually show long-term and the Harvard study of adult development, it's one of the, the long, longest longitudinal studies ever done. Track these people from when they were sophomores in college all the way up to when they died. And they found that your social support, the quality of your social you know, relationships is a better predictor of your health at 50 than your cholesterol levels. And they found that loneliness and isolation is basically the equivalent in terms of physically, actually affecting you physically of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, chronic loneliness. And then it actually matters. It, it's more of a negative effect on you than obesity, physical activity, air pollution, um, all of these different things. And so when you feel that physical pain of loneliness, it's actually affecting you, especially if it's chronic. So it's something that like you have this fundamental need and we need to look at how can we actually connect in these areas, both in terms of like, it's one of the number one ways that we can live a quality life. Um, all the happiness, all of that kind of stuff goes, goes into that. Um, but then even in terms of a, if you're just looking at the science of how does it affect our body, you know, you have compromised immune systems, like it even affects your DNA transcription. So it is incredibly important, but we minimize it. And we say like, oh, it's just like I'm lonely, right? But it, it actually affects your body in a tremendous ways, more so sometimes than even some of the physical things that we think are, are really important. Wow, that's, that's, so, um, that's so consistent with what I've seen that when we try to explain, you know, why is it that this person lived till age so-and-so and they have a drink every day and they smoke a cigarette every day, but they're happy. And again, not advocating that you add the cigarette and the alcohol to your regimen if you don't already have those. Um, but just that idea of uh, the best way to put it, I guess, just us not being aware of all the variables that are really in play, as opposed to just thinking, you know, people say, oh, you know, he was in such good shape and he got a heart attack and this and that. And then you sometimes hear about kind of what was going on. Oh, well, there was this thing was going on and there was some disconnect and, um, you know, there's some pain going on because this thing happened or, or that thing happened. Um, I think and that's just another another point. I mean, you talked about decision making and stuff, and there's a bunch of research on this, but we don't necessarily even need the research on it. Like if you go into like a board meeting and you're trying to, you know, negotiate a business acquisition or, you know, some land, some, you know, super important client, and you just had a terrible fight with your with your spouse or your kids. Like, you know, that your decision making at that moment is not on point, not the way it should be, even from like an anecdotally, you know what, the, there's tons of research around that, how it affects our productivity, right? You know, when like you have this fight, your, your mind is not on your work. It's not on like, I need to make the best decision right now. It's just like a hot mess inside your brain of like what's going on actually socially. Um, but we don't take that in terms of the criteria. We don't weight it heavily enough in terms of how it affects some of those other areas of even our business and our entrepreneurship life. Absolutely. One of the thing you mentioned in the, in our initial conversation was loneliness being a perception. 
and maybe this is that area where you know different people process it differently. Share a little bit more about that if you don't mind. Yeah, so basically 50%, it's a, it's a little bit less. So it's actually 48%, but 50% is easier to say. So 50% of your the loneliness that you actually feel is genetically predetermined. So it's genetically different people have different sensitivities to social disconnection or social rejection. And the reason why that's important to mention, one is it gives us compassion for ourselves, right? You, you might be somebody that maybe like you move next door from, you know, your parents or, you know, what's going, you know, the community that you have, and all of a sudden you feel super isolated, right? Or somebody else moves all the way across the world and they're like, totally fine. And you're going, what's wrong with me, right? Some of it might be a genetic predisposition to, to that, right? The thing with the genetic predisposition, obviously, is we can't control it, right? So there's that 50% that we can't control. And this actually is pretty much across the board in terms of happiness, neuroticism, any of those things. A lot of times it's pretty close to that 50% in terms of genetics. What we can actually affect is the other 50%. And that has to do with how we handle it essentially mentally. So our expect expectations that we have for other people um, and then how we approach it mentally, but then also how we approach it emotionally and how we can actually handle the, the pain of that. So all of the research around loneliness is actually subjective loneliness. You can be objectively lonely, right? You're out in the middle of a forest, you're out in a desert, whatever it is, and actually not feel alone. And you can be in a room of hundreds of people and feel absolutely alone or, or in a marriage or, you know, whatever it is in a relationship and just feel totally alone. And so it's actually subjective feel of loneliness. That's important. And the, that's where the research around the negative effects come from um, in terms of, in terms of that. Awesome. Thank you. So then what are steps people can take to navigate loneliness to to manage it to, to put themselves in a better situation so it's not something um, that is really kind of taking them off track yeah and so there's two different ways you know you have internal strategies and you have external strategies so one thing that people don't realize is loneliness is a state right so it's a subjective feeling so you can actually change the feeling of loneliness without actually interacting with any other person um, and the way that you can actually do this, I call it basically your loneliness shield. So you can picture um, all of the people around you and you can do, you know, if you're, if you do meditation consistently, you can sit down and you can kind of get into that relaxed state. It helps to just kind of visualize things better, um, but you don't have to, right? But you picture all of the people around you that have had a positive impact on your life. So it might be, it might be family, it might be friends, um, it might not, right? But it could be teachers, it could be coaches, it could be mentors, whoever it is, you can picture them around you, just encourage you and saying, Hey, you're doing a great job. I loved how you, you know, navigated this tough challenge that you had going on. I'm really, really proud of you. You know, maybe they're giving you hugs. Maybe they're giving you high fives, whatever that looks like. And you can actually enter into that experience. And same with like holidays. Let's say you have these different holidays and they can be really like lonely times, or if we're all separated from everybody and socially isolated, you can picture the amazing times that you've had with family and going on road trips and these adventures and stuff that you have and immerse yourself in that. And physiologically, your brain will basically treat it as if you're there. Um, so that's how you can change the internal state, but it's obviously a temporary thing. So if you're looking at external strategies, um, the thing that I would say, and it sounds really simple, right? But if you have a super important business meeting, like you just put it in your calendar, like, and you put reminders for it, whatever you do, whatever it takes to like, make sure that that happens. Right. Well, what about, what about if you asked, what are the 20% of the people that I actually feel most alive with most comfortable with or the most encouraging, the most supporting, whatever it is and go, how could I actually just be a little bit more intentional about scheduling time with them? Hopefully it'd be in person. Maybe it's over the phone. What would that look like? And just kind of think like, it doesn't have to totally revamp your whole schedule, but how could I actually just schedule a little bit more time with the people? And then the other thing that I would mention is looking at all of your different interactions. I call this interaction upgrade. So if you're, if you're on social media, just pay attention when you finish, when you get off of social media, pay attention. Do you feel more connected with people? Um, afterwards, 
And you might, right? You might actually feel more connected. I'm not saying it's one way or another, but I'm saying pay attention. And if you don't feel more connection, maybe you can go, how can I just upgrade these interactions slightly, right? We're not overhauling everything. It's just going, if you normally leave a like, maybe just put a comment underneath their post and go, hey, this really meant a lot to me. Like, for content creators, that's like, this is amazing. You know, somebody's actually listening. So it helps them as well. Um, but then if you like potentially just write a comment, maybe you send them a message, you know, or if you normally send people texts, give them a call, give them actually like on a video or see if you can schedule the in-person time, but take those interactions and just go, how can I just step it up a tiny little bit, not a ton, just a tiny little bit to actually go, can I get more connection from the things that I'm already doing in my life? Awesome. Thank you. There, there's so much to this and, and gosh, I know there's a lot more you have. I know you have your podcast and you have your program. Will you share a little bit about what you do for the people listening so they can understand how you help people specifically? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I work with entrepreneurs, you know, like you mentioned at the start to, to really help them feel like they're enough and, and that they're not alone. So it's, it's navigating some of these things and going, where is this coming from? How can we become more aware of what's actually going on inside of me and what needs, you know, like we talked about that I'm actually trying to fulfill and how can I actually maybe fulfill them in more positive ways? Or maybe like you've gotten to a certain point and you've achieved a certain level of success and then you realize, wow, I sacrificed so many other areas of my life to get to this point, right? Maybe my relate, maybe my health is not as where I want it to be. Maybe my relationships are kind of like rocky with my family or, you know, whatever it is, the important people in my life, you know, and you're like, this is my, my, might not be what I want. And I help people just kind of bring balance to the force, so to speak. Like, how can we, how can we bring it back into balance? So we go, what are we actually wanting to pursue and how can we get there? And then also just like, how do we navigate all the chaos and whatever that's going on um, in everybody's life um, is essentially what I do in terms of a coaching. So I have the coaching, the coaching side of it. And then I also um, have a podcast called success engineering. And that's where I just like, I interview people, that are successful in a wide variety of fields. So Broadway directors, neuroscientists, CEOs, and ask, like, pull back the curtain on success and go, you know, what, where are your fears, the doubts, the loneliness that you had? How did you navigate through that? You know, what did, what did that look like for you? Um, which I absolutely love. I love just going like, what does it actually look like behind, you know, behind the appearance of it? So I have that as well. Um, if people are interested in checking it out. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll put the links to all of that. Uh, in the show notes, or if you're listening, it'll be in the in the section where you can see the links from the episode. Michael, thank you so much for sharing this. There's there's so much I can sense. There's so much more you have to share. Really encourage people to check out your work. Um, anything else you'd like to leave the audience with before we finish? Um, if they're interested, they can go to the website and there's a um, you can download my success engineering ebook, which basically has like a lot of these questions, these value based questions around success to just get that framework of going, what would this look like? What's the foundation of what this looks like? And then how can we build on top of that? So they can check that out if they're interested as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And for the, all of you all listening, I encourage you, it, it's it can be a long journey. It doesn't have to be a lonely journey. Uh, reach out, continue, whether it's his podcast, my podcast, the people we've mentioned. We've mentioned so many awesome mentors on today's call. Uh, so reach out, do your research, keep moving forward. Let me know and let Michael know whatever we can do to help. And as always, look forward to helping you help more people and make more money in less time. Do what you do best so you can better enjoy your family, your friends, and your life. Thanks for listening.